Ask yourself, what's the best customer experience you've had in the last year? Write it down. Tell yourself the story. Tell someone else the story. Then ask yourself, be really honest, be ruthlessly honest if you are capable and say, where is my customer experience on a scale? If that's a 10, if that experience that I had is a 10, where am I? And what could I do right now to improve it a little bit? And if you, if you take that away from this podcast, I think we've actually helped your Facebook acquisition. Hey everyone, welcome to the e-commerce playbook podcast. My name is Richard Gaffin, the self-styled, I guess, professor here at Common Thread Collective. That's, that's the title I'm going with for podcast purposes, let's say. And I'm joined today by, as ever, by the CEO of Common Thread Collective, Mr. Taylor Holiday. He's wearing headphones. He's got a microphone. We've had no technical difficulties, and uh, so we got a professional setup going. How are you doing, Taylor? Good. We've had a real, we had a very serious conversation about leveling up our effort on the podcast and content and video. So hopefully you're going to see improvements. Hopefully my audio is an improvement over time. So we're going to try it this thing. We're going to actually try at it. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. By the way, can we yeah, expect D2C professor or some social debut of this persona? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have to figure out the branding for that. Maybe wear glasses and I'm already basically wearing the coat. I just need to have like patches on the elbows or something. Then I'll be there. It's there for but you. Yeah. It's there for you. Yeah, that's right. I'll be on Twitter more, I promise. So anyway, yeah, we got our voices set. You can hear Taylor well. We're going to get into kind of an interesting topic today. One thing that we talk about in our content here at CTC all the time is the acquisition issue, right? CPMs keep getting higher. Advertising keeps getting more and more expensive on Facebook and in other paid social platforms. Uh, and the solution is clearly not to just make better Facebook ads. It's clearly not some kind of trick in platform in order to make your ROAS look better or whatever. And obviously we've spilled a lot of ink on why single account ROAS is a bad thing in general, but Taylor, you have an interesting idea about what the solution might be. And it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to do with the quality of your Facebook ads. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited about this one. Okay. So much yeah, of this podcast right. is just like the output of things that are happening around me. Right. And so my reality right now is that I spend every waking second in my dreams, in the shower, while I'm working out, trying to think about how to solve for Facebook ad efficiencies and new customer acquisition and growth for our customers. Right. And it plagues me in this moment to do this. And this is why the retina test is so exciting. And the CLV to CAC optimization is one thing. But it's not the only way, and it's not the only way we are going to try and solve this problem in the future for our customers. There's another way. And I've stumbled on this sort of accidentally. I've stumbled on it in our own journey as an agency, which is that as an entrepreneur, there's this like evolutionary skill that you develop that's about survival. And that skill is really about sales. It's about going and getting the next person to say yes to keep you alive. Because when you have no customers, the only way you eat, so to speak, is if you get more customers. And that becomes the skill that you develop, that, that you hone over time, that often is what grows your business. And in that, though, there's a danger that what you can lose is care for the customer once you've acquired them. Is that you can think that you've got to move on to the next sale and you move on. And I see this a lot in growth marketing, too, which is that once they're across the ROAS threshold, there's somebody else's problem now. My job is to go get more of those ROAS, just go get more customers. And it's like this exploitive extraction from a human. And I started doing these. So I've been going through this reflection of, we have customers at CTC that are worth like millions of dollars to us that are fundamentally, we aren't where we are without Bear and Edward and a bunch of these folks that like committed to us to go on a really long journey and have been partners for a long time. They're just so critical to who we are. And I think I've lost sight of them in some way. We talk about that as a marketing department, like we create content. Does it go to the public before it goes to our customers? And how customer centric are we really? And so I've been doing a lot of like personal reflecting on this. And inside of admission, our learning community, I teach these masterminds where I have groups of people, different leaders, and we go on these like six month journeys together. And I'm doing this for a couple of cohorts right now. And the first thing I do is I make them reflect on this idea that how, how like customer centric is you, how amazing is your customer experience? And so we do this reflection where they say, what was the best customer experience you've had in the last year? Oh, I went to this chef and he did this amazing thing, or I walked into this retailer and they knew my sizes and started lowering the dressing room for me. It's okay. If that's a 10, if that experience is so good that you're here telling stories about it. What's your, sir, what's your customer experience like? Is it a four? Is it a six? Are people telling other people about it? And then we ask, okay, of your highest value customers, go into Shopify, sort by amount spent. 
of those 50 people, how many of their names do you know? Is it one? Is it zero? Is it all of them? And what's the communication been like with them? How much have you treated them? Because bear matters to me. These customers matter to you. I was looking the other day. There's Bamboo Earth. There are women that have bought $8,000 worth of face cream that have ordered 81 times over the history of the brand. Like we aren't where we are without that commitment to in partnership in the business. Okay. So what, okay, great, Taylor. Customer experience, it matters. Why is this a solution to your acquisition problems? Okay. If we accept that in some fashion, the cost to acquire the next customer and the next customer and the next customer has a certain gravitational element to it, meaning it will always rise on some slope over a wide enough window. There's days where it goes backwards. There's weeks where it goes backwards. But over the long enough window, the cost to acquire a customer will rise. Then how do we win this game? And I believe that there's two answers, okay? One is you increase the value of each individual customer. Their LTV goes up. They spend more money with you to offset the cost to acquire them. This happens through product expansion. This happens through subscription. There's all sorts of tactics, right? But the second way is that you increase your viral coefficient greater than one. Okay, what the hell is we'll a viral about coefficient? That what, is the, what does that mean? Okay, so we all just came out of COVID era and we heard a lot about the viral coefficient, the r not. right, Richard? You were very conscious of the r not during COVID days, right? You know what it means? Right. Do you know what it means? What happens if your r not's greater than one? Do you know what that means? Actually, maybe I have no idea what r not is now that I think. Okay, so it's the measure of for every one person that's infected with the virus, how many people will they infect? Okay, and if the r not is greater than one, you'll have an exponential growth of the virus because for every one person, they will bring more than one with them. And if you use that as a, on a curve, it creates not linear growth, that's exponential growth. Like such that if you just start and draw it as a tree, one person does two, then each of those two bring two and see how quickly you realize you have a really big tree of people. This is a premise in software that people think about all the time. They think about growth hacking to a viral coefficient. And so the reason when you log on to LinkedIn, they ask you to connect your contacts so that they can invite people is all about this viral coefficient. But we don't think about this much in consumer product because it's not as obvious to track and to measure. But Seth Godin has this principle that he calls sneezers. Okay. So again, we're talking about viruses. We're talking about viral coefficients. We're talking about sneezing, spreading ideas or products. And so the idea is a sneezer is somebody who takes your business, your idea and spreads it into the world and identifying who those people are and empowering and equipping those people is really important. So if we go back and we think, okay, I asked a bunch of people to tell me about a customer experience that was so good that they had to share the story in that moment. They all just sneezed on me. They sneezed me, the retailer, (laughs) the brand, the business based on the quality of customer experience. And so I fundamentally believe that making your customer experience worth talking about, worth spreading is a story worth telling is actually one of the critical keys to offsetting rising acquisition costs and allowing your business to continue to scale. It's, it is that essential. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. And one thing a little, we talked about this a little bit in our conversation prior to hit and record, but doing that effectively requires understanding your customer as a human being primarily, because the reason I think about that is that this sort of talk of virality or getting people to engage with or become ambassadors for your brand or whatever, it's often also frames the sort of, let's make the numbers just work out right play, right? Can we create a piece of content that people are going to love to share? And that's the way we're going to create viral engagement for a brand or whatever. Now, obviously that's not what you're talking about specifically, although perhaps it would play a role. But what are the components of viral customer experience? Okay, that's the God, Richard. That's a brilliant question. We didn't even plan that Thank question. You. <laughs> we sure didn't. When you ask people this, go ask your friends. Tell them to tell you about their la- their best customer experience. And there's a set of common traits that are in there. Okay, and here's what some of them are that I've identified. One, it's personalized. It feels unique to me. So the example I gave. A woman walks into a retailer and the clerk knows her and starts filling the dressing room with her size, her style, 
because she knows what it is. Wow, you know me. I, amidst all the customers, I am special. I want to feel special. It's personalized. That's a very common one. A second common attribute is it's unexpected. It's, a, it's beyond the scope of what you thought you signed up for. Mm -hmm. I said this, they brought me, they knew it was my anniversary and they brought me a free dessert. The chef came out and asked us how we were doing. There's something that happened that was beyond whatever the expectation was. Okay. Those are two very common traits. And I'm going to give you like, okay, so it's personal and it's unexpected. So if you think about all the things, like a lot of times what people will say is, oh, I'm going to make a better post-purchase email experience, or I'm going to include something in the packaging. And it's like, okay. But everybody expects to get an email after they buy a product and everybody expects there to be something in the box. So the question, the, that's not enough in and of itself. And so mm -hmm. Taylor, okay, this is pretty ambiguous. What do you mean? Let me tell you what somebody in my mastermind did. Like this is freaking incredible. So this is a shout out to Kenny at the Wander Club. They sell like charms where if you travel, it's it to memorialize the experience that you had. They do it for like baseball stadiums. And so maybe people are going around to visit every baseball stadium or every country or all the capitals of the US, whatever. After we did this first session, this is the kind of thing like the, an entrepreneur who like gets an idea and is, yes, this is going to change. Like, I'm going to go action against it now. This is, I love this so much more than I expected him to do. So much so that I'm telling his story right now, right? Beyond my expectations. Right. So we say, all right, yeah, you got to think about this. He goes, he hires a person that is expressly responsible for creating magical customer experiences for his existing customers. So he creates a role. Okay. The second thing he does is they have a post-purchase survey called Inquire. He sets up on the post-purchase survey, tell us something about yourself and why this charm matters to you. A very open-ended question for people to gather intimate knowledge about their customers in ways that are beyond the sort of general demographic data. He sets up a Zapier connection to pull all of those responses into Slack, creates a Slack channel called Customer Stories, okay? Every one of those stories feeds to the whole company and his new CX person. And the stories are amazing. He starts getting people saying things like, me and my son are on our 16th visit to a stadium and this was, we're gonna get one of these every time together. Or I, he told me that somebody was like, I was diagnosed with a terminal illness and traveling is gonna be the last thing that I do. Like intimate details yeah. of their life. Every single person that fills it out gets a personalized email from Kenny's email Okay, by the CX person referencing their story and why it matters to them and saying thank you for participating. Personalized, unexpected response from the CEO based on their story. I can't believe you read this. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Then that's not it though. He's not even done there. He then creates a second Slack channel. This Slack channel is order value greater than $300 and filled out the survey. Ah, these are VIP customers. These are whales. Now we're actually not just going to respond to their thing. We're actually going to use money, their money to surprise and delight them. Maybe we're going to buy them upgraded seats at the next stadium they're going to. Maybe we're going to buy them a hat from that thing or a dinner at the country that they're traveling to or a gift card to the best, blah, blah, whatever. We're going to say, your story really matters to me. You went out of your way to offer my business a lot of money. I'm going to give back to you in a way that shows I genuinely care about you. Yeah. When he's telling this story, I watched 12 people in a room start as fast as they could typing, taking notes. And we're like, oh my God. And again, I stopped and I went, everyone, I was like, you're competing against Kenny. Like when you, when we talk about creating sneezers, like you're cre competing against Kenny and he's going to kick your ass and your product's going to die because no one's going to tell anyone about it. And that's the reality that we all live in is, is anyone going to tell anyone about the experience that they had with your product? Is anyone, or is it just going to die? And you're going to have to go acquire more customers and more customers. And they're all just going to. And so I think that is like a very tangible example of an incredible way that I believe is going to make a meaningful difference on his business. Yeah. Genius. Be, be like Kenny is the lesson here. Dude, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, it's the genius of finding a way to essentially automate something that's 
in and of itself very human and would be it's not automatic is really genius to That's just right. i was talking about this idea of having your slack channel just inundated with value proposition material to work from it's incredible from it's right yeah and uh, I was going to say, it's like, a, there's a valuable lesson, I think, for creative here as well. So not only like the customer experience and the stories your customers tell need to inform your advertising, acquiring those new people. It's not that they're not individuals before you acquire them. And once you acquire them, they suddenly become human to you. That's right. But you have That's to right. take the human stories you're being told and turn them into top funnel outward facing messaging as well. Um, That's right. I th yeah. I think specifically about, or, or rather, this is more like a principle that I think about a lot when it comes to creating ads. Like we are as marketers and as probably human beings as well are just really bad at observing our own experiences of shopping. You know what I mean? It's what do I like when I buy something? When, I'm, right. when I'm creating advertising for other people or, or that's for some product, whatever, I don't necessarily think about that. I think about the data. I think about all of this other, these other tools that we create for ourselves. But I don't think as much as I should is like, how do I feel when I make a purchase or when, it, when the company screws up and then they make it right? What are the things that feel good to me? Dude, I, and I'll say this to our designers all the time. Are you compelled to, to does this yeah. ad, are you stopping in your Instagram feed? Think about the things that have stopped you. And there's this very human element to this, of, of to, to buying. I, we were at, we, Maui Gym is one of our customers. They sell mm -hmm. sunglasses and we were talking about the framing of purchasing sunglasses. And I was like, for me, I got a big nose. And so sunglasses, the whole thing for me is, does this make me feel worse or better about this feature that I'm insecure about? And the whole pro the entire buying process is predicated on that one idea. And everything that I think about in that process is related to how can I get an answer to that question? And it's really hard for me to buy sunglasses because I don't know how to answer the question for myself without really just going in. And even trying them on in a store is an insecure thing for me because I assume most look bad on me. So it's a hard thing for me. I know I'm not the only person like that. And there, there's a version of that story for a bunch of people for a bunch of products. And that the thing that you need to get to is somehow to get into their being and to understand them in a way that's like listening and caring and extracting out of them what matters to them. And so you're right. And that's why I like to start this exercise with tell me about something that mattered to you. Because what it does is it creates a feeling, right? Know how, you know what it's like to feel special, right? Like when someone makes you feel special, you know what that feels like. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that sometimes we, and I'm guilty of this, like the data and the ROAS and the LTV to CAC and the, and I'll go all day in that world. And this is my weak point. I have to stop and I have to go, do I care? Do I actually care? Um, yeah. So yeah. going back to that idea of shopping, being an emotive or emotional behavior. And when too often, when you create advertising, you're trying to solve an emotional problem with logical solutions, right? If I can sit down and logic out That's what right. somebody would like, it's going to work. But anyway, like the way that this connects to what we were saying before is what's the best way? Because oftentimes, let's say I'm selling women's apparel. I don't know what it feels like to buy that. I'm a human being, so I know what it feels like to buy something, but I still have to get in somebody else's head. And the best way to do that is to listen to what your customers are saying. That's and right. so it has that sort of one-two punch of improving your acquisition and improving your CX at the same time. That's right. And so I think that one of the things that we're going to see happen, and even like part of it is I'm going to turn Kenny's thing into a service at CTC. I really am. This is going to happen. So if you're interested in this, like I want to talk to you <laughs> because yeah. I really believe that there's this whole future of business that is, there's a bunch of people running off and going, again, this is part of my attribution thing. It's like, we're going to solve the advertising problem with these technical improvements to acquisition. And I'm just like, I don't see that. It's not the, it's not the future I see. It's not the future in my head. It's, there's something else. And there are people that are still winning right now. And they're, what is true about them? One of the things I've talked about on Twitter is that who's winning right now? Religions, products that are religions. This idea, like mm -hmm. I, the other day I put out a tweet that said, don't start a brand, start a religion. And yeah. the idea is- What's a company, an example of one of those? Okay. So things that are oriented around like diets, okay? Right. Or healthcare related stuff. There's a company called Heart and Soil that I'm close with the founders and team there. They're awesome dudes. And I went to dinner with them. And when they tell me about why they work at the company, 
it's a conversion story. They're telling me their testimony for those of you that grew up in the church world, right? Like they, it sounds something like I was sick and now I'm, they don't say I applied to the job and the benefits were this. And the role was, it has nothing to do with that. This is, this is my life. It transformed me. And so of course I'm here and mm. their customers are the same. Like they're not buying a product. They, they, you solved something for their life in a way that they're like, I'm never leaving. Like I yeah. buy something else. Never. I'm, I, and their LTV reflects that. It's one of the most incredible businesses that I've ever seen. And so it's it, in that sense, the experience of the use of the product is so connected to their identity of who they are as a person. That's what religion is. It becomes the primary identity attribute of a person that before anything else, they're a Christian, they're a Muslim, they're a Jew, they're whatever, like that becomes the primary identifying attribute. And so if you can develop a product, like I'm a CrossFitter, like where these things become primary identifying attributes of someone's personhood. <laughs> oh, that's, I'm a Nike athlete. I'm a Adidas guy. Like you get these things that are like that, where it becomes yeah. a statement about you. That's powerful. To touch on a CTC pillar, which is that no two businesses are alike. I think both brands that we've mentioned so far, Kenny's brand, the Wander Club, and then Heart and Soil are both lend themselves, let's say, to that type of religious or deeply personal experience with the brand. For yeah. instance, Kenny's brand is about sentiment already, right? It's already fundamentally emotional. So for yes. people out there who have brands that do not feel fundamentally emotional, like we sell moist towelettes, whatever, probably you're not going to build a religion around that, but what oh. can they do? Okay. Here, okay. <laughs> now we're talking, so, build me, build me a moist towelette religion. Taylor. Okay. So o Ogilvy and Mather, go read, go back to, me and you advertising 101, right? Yeah. The classic ads, Guinness, okay? The, the ad for Guinness, what Guinness does is they don't tell you about the flavor or the features. The classic ad that I'm referencing, if you look up David Ogilvy Guinness oyster ad, it's a grid of nine or 15 different types of oysters uh, and a fact about all of them. Because the kind of man that drinks a Guinness knows about the oysters at the bar. And so it becomes the kind of person. Again, the I, Guinness is an identity statement about who I am. Go to Dove. When Dove does the ad where they have, what's the legendary Dove ad? Where they have women look at themselves and say, are they beautiful? Or how would you describe yourself? Or whatever that legendary, like, again, they're saying we're the kind of company that sees you as beautiful as you are. We believe. So using Dove, is an identity statement that says, I am beautiful, right? Like, right. so you don't, this is the problem. You can't win saying that your soap smells better than everybody else's soap because that's subjective and it's probably not actually true. And even if it's true for some people, it's not true for all people. No, you have to go further, right? What does this product say about who you are? And that does, that could be anything, man. Like, that like you could turn toothpaste into an identity statement. And so I think that's where classic marketers knew this. They understood this. They had to. And so I think we're, it's funny. Like I tell people right now a lot, like how, they're like, how do I buy in my ad account? And I'm like, you're buying on TV. Like the old days, wait for the data, the way to the data iterate, change the headline, wait for the results, fix it a little, improve, iterate, iterate, iterate. It's gone. Can't trust the data anymore. Feedback's broken. Yeah. You're not really sure what to do. So what do you do? Make a great freaking ad and publish it and distribute it. Measure it generally. Right. Just make hits. That's what it's all about. Okay, so if you want to do this exercise with me, create a, let's call it religious in this definition, CX post-purchase experience for this moist towelette company. And I picked okay. that specifically because I can see somebody executing this like kind of clunkily and saying my moist towelette and on every single one, there's, I don't know, some character trait or whatever. Maybe that's a good idea. I don't know. But I could see it like really being executed poorly where they don't really think deeply into why people use moist towelettes and they just decide to start creating like a cool brand around it. So were you to create this type of experience for a moist towelette brand, how would you do it? Okay. So there's a few different things. Oh man. I, okay. So one, let's okay. use the Kenny principle here. So I'm going to ask them like, what's the spill you're cleaning up most or what's the last spill you cleaned up? and tell me about what happened. Okay. So in the post-purchase survey, my daughter 
spilled cranberry juice on the couch. And so we immediately had to rush and pick it up. Oh, okay. So now I know some things about you. You drink cranberry juice. You have a daughter. I'm going to send a 12 pack of si or a sippy cup with a cool lid. And I'm going to, so I'm going to, I'm going to extract the information and I'm going to build this really deep connection and caring to the individual experiences of the users. Okay. So that's like the create a magical experience based on the information. Let's take the Kenny principle and let's apply it there. Right now, in terms of the religious experience, the question is like, okay, moist towelettes, are these like wipes? What do we have here? Do we have, what am I yeah, saying? I, I guess in this, it would be like, uh, like wet ones or something like that, where it's just like, you have them in the bathroom. Maybe it's for your kids primarily, okay. or you use it as just like a hand sanitizer to have around. Something like that. So here's the premise. The kind of person that has moist towelettes understands the experiences of people that need them. And they're almost always slightly embarrassing and a little bit, um, bad. And so you're the kind of person that sees people in their weakness and cares about it. Okay. So let me give you examples. Moist towelettes. My daughter, she's five. She's learning to wipe. Okay. Someday she's going to hate me for saying this, right? <laughs> she's a girl that creates a slew of problems potentially. And it's like, she has brothers and it becomes this embarrassing thing that she has to work on together. And so there's this whole process that my wife has of like really helping her become good at this using moist towelettes and that kind of person that sits with and cares and needs for that. And then I contrast that. I have my wife doing that same thing for an elderly person. That's a, you know, that part of life when like you can no longer actually wipe your own ass. That's embarrassing. But what is it like to humanize someone in that moment? And the people who use this product, they're those kinds of people. Yeah. They humanize the elderly in that moment. And so this brand on your shelf it says to a stranger walking into your bathroom, I care about the experience that you're having here and it matters to me. I'm yeah. that kind of person. And so I build this like religious experience around the kinds of service oriented humans that offer wet wipes. And it feels so frivolous, but you could see it, right? It's there. You could feel it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I definitely see there being a version of the customer experience process for that brand where they actually demonstrate that care. And then the demonstration of that care becomes the, that becomes the ad that becomes right. the kind of the building of the brand or the building of the movement. So to speak. even though I think there is an element where you have to, I'm not going to get my customer to, to say out loud, I'm part of a wet towelette movement or whatever. No, We're right, going right. to say that, but that's fine. Yeah. Um, ultimately they're going to be loyal to you in the way that matters most to you. And so I always, I reference a lot. There's a company called first media that is one of the best content creators on the internet. Like I always say, if you want to know great content creators, look at media companies more than brands because media companies have to make money on their media. That's that they actually have, right. that's their money making. They own like Blossom and a bunch of Facebook pages that create like socially native viral content. And I think at one point for three years in a row, they had the most viewed videos on Facebook, like really viral content. And I heard their, their director, their like lead creative director speak once. And he said that they had a very simple thesis that their entire media development plan was built around one metric. It was share rate. And if they knew if they could get the share rate from the Facebook average, which was like one and a half percent to 3% that they'd have a viral hit. And they could tell within like 10,000 impressions if the video was going to be a hit or not. And so the question was what generates share rate? And so they said, the entire thing is you have to create for your audience's audience. A lot of times we make the mistake that we are trying to be the hero in the customer's story. And the key is to make the customer the hero to their audience. So they use this example where they're cooking with a crock pot. Okay. And they said, most people, when they make a crock pot ad are like, check out our crock pot. It's so much better than the other crock pots. And it heats up faster than the other crock pots. And it's got a better warranty and it's made from cooler ceramics. And the way that they sold crock pots was, here are 10 DIY party tricks that you can do with your crock pot to be the star of your next hosted gathering. And it's like how to make hot dogs and fondue and all these clever ways to use a crock pot. And the whole point was they had a persona, a woman in their mind that was going to host a party and they wanted everyone at the party to go, Claire, you're so clever. This is just the, this is the most interesting use of a crock pot I've ever seen. And if that happens, Claire is a hero. And Claire likes your crock pot because you made her special in her world. And that's your job is to like, think about it. And I think that framing is something that stuck with me forever is that I'm creating for my audience's audience. How do I make them a hero in their world? Yeah. How do you remove yourself from 
that conversation a little bit. I think that's really hard to do. Something yeah. we were talking about earlier too, like the Kenny method of CX, let's say, or getting just getting information in from actual customers helps you take the step towards getting yourself out of the conversation and saying, it's not that's about right. us. It's not about the brand. It's about you and the people that you know. That's um, right. Cool. Any other, uh, anything else you want to hit on this? Well, I, th yeah. I think it's go read. So go think about, go do this exercise. Ask yourself, what's the best customer experience you've had in the last year? Write it down. Tell yourself the story. Tell someone else the story. Then ask yourself, be really honest, be ruthlessly honest if you are capable and say, where is my customer experience on a scale? If that's a 10, if that experience that I had is a 10, where am I? And what could I do right now to improve it a little bit? And if you, if you take that away from this podcast, I think we've actually helped your Facebook acquisition. As weird as that yeah. sounds. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's going to get better on the front end, even though we started right. out by saying that it's not about improving your Facebook ads. That's right. Spoiler That's alert. Right. That's right. Cool. Thanks again for joining us on the e-commerce playbook podcast. Please remember to rate and review. And if you're watching on YouTube, also remember to like, and subscribe. It really helps us out. If you're interested in starting a conversation with us about retention, customer experience, and just working together in general, please don't hesitate to drop us a line at common thread co we'd love to chat. And until next time, have a good one and happy scaling.